Welcome back to the second part of this lecture. In the last part of this lecture, I introduced to you the concept of life cycle analysis, and we talked through the five steps of the process. Now, in this lecture, what we're going to do is to look at the production process for polyethylene terephthalate and figure out a few things about it. We're going to figure out its energy use and its environmental impacts. Now, my friend, the ghost of chemical engineering past, has already told you a little bit about the production of polyethylene terephthalate. If you recall, it relies on the benzene, toluene and xylene value chain within the petrochemical industry. Now, however, it's time to lift the lid on the process itself and examine it in a little bit more detail. Now, if we're going to figure out what the energy use and environmental impact of a functional unit of polyethylene terephthalate is, we also need to know a little bit more about the supporting processes. So we'll discuss those in a little bit more detail as well. One of the tools I'm going to introduce to you in this part of this lecture is a tool to help you visualize energy use. This is the Sankey diagram. I'm going to introduce to you what a Sankey diagram is, how you read one, and then how we get a Sankey diagram for the production of polyethylene terephthalate. We're also going to see what other environmental impacts the production of our functional unit has and see what the sorts of trade-offs that we might have to make. So I'm now displaying for you a little bit more detail about the manufacturing of polyethylene terephthalate. This forms part of the life cycle analysis scoping exercise. Now, you form PET by taking ethylene glycol, a dialcohol, and pure terephthalic acid, a diacid. Pure terephthalic acid is made from paraxylene, so it's dimethylbenzene with the methyl groups opposite each other on the benzene ring, and then that para position is where you find the alcohol, is find, where you find the acid groups and the pure terephthalic acid. So the first stage is to get ethylene glycol, our dialcohol, and pure terephthalic acid, our diacid, and esterify them. Okay, after esterification, what we do is we add a catalyst and start to encourage these esters to come together and polymerize. This is called a pre-polymerization step. At this point, you have a fairly low viscosity system and it's relatively straightforward to mix in a catalyst and start to get maybe one or two or three or four repeat units of esters polymerizing together. Once you have this pre-polymer, maybe up to eight or ten repeat units long, you then go into a melt polymerization stage. This is where you increase the molecular weight greatly from maybe 10 or so repeat units to maybe 70, 80, 90, 100 repeat units. By this time, the viscosity of the system has increased massively and requires a completely different process technology in order to take place. Hence, it's a different processing step. Now, depending on what we're making, we might need something that has material strength. A polyethylene terephthalate drinks bottle needs a lot of strength to keep in place the hoop stresses placed on it by the pressure of the drink inside it. Polyethylene terephthalate drinks bottles can take up to about 5 bar of internal pressure. So we need a final polymerization step to increase the molecular weight further in order to get that mechanical property. And this takes place in a solid state. And so we have three stages of polymerization. We have the pre-polymerization to get 10-ish repeat units. We have the melt polymerization to get 70 to 100 repeat units. Then we've got our solid state polymerization to increase the molecular weight further still such that we can get the mechanical properties of the final polymer. Okay, so that's the production route from ethylene glycol and pure terephthalic acid through to our chipped polymer. However, these processes themselves require support. So what we find is that we need to add heat in to esterify ethylene glycol and pure terephthalic acid. And so that heat has an energy overhead associated with it. You also find that there are byproducts produced from this esterification process. And so you get acid aldehyde produced as a waste product and you also get water. You've got condensation polymerization occurring. Both of these byproducts need to be removed. As you remove the byproducts, you also get rid of some of your feedstocks. Some of the ethylene glycol gets boiled off with the water and the ethylene glycol. And so you need to purify that ethylene glycol and recycle it back into your reacting system, which again requires energy. Now, if we consider the polymerization process, this typically takes place under vacuum because 
if we put these systems under vacuum, we can more easily draw out those waste products, the water and the acid aldehyde. As you draw out these waste products, you will, of course, also be drawing out some of your reacting mixture. And what you do is you spray this reacting mixture with ethylene glycol to condense out anything that can be condensed out and return reactants back into the reacting system. So you have a spray condensation step. I said that this polymerization process takes place under vacuum, so you need a, a means of generating vacuum. Typically, this is generated in a number of stages in, using vacuum ejectors, which are a fluid mechanical means of generating a vacuum, and a final stage of a vacuum pump. Of course, all of these processes themselves require energy. So, our production process for PET is a little bit more complex than just make some esters, polymerize those esters, and get a high molecular weight from those esters. All the reacting systems need supporting processes which have energy overheads. So, let's have a look at the system this sits within, because if we think of this as our process, we haven't considered the entire food chain. So, let's have a look at what needs to support the manufacture of PET. Now, first of all, we need ethylene, because we're going to make ethylene glycol. Let's assume that we're sourcing ethylene from naphtha, and you know that naphtha can be sourced from crude oil. And let's say that we can get data on ethylene production from naphtha via steam cracking from an existing study. Right, so what do we do with ethylene? Well, from ethylene, we make ethylene oxide. Really unstable, really explosive, something you don't want hanging around for very good safety grounds. You need about 5.3 grams of ethylene to make enough ethylene oxide to go into our functional unit. Incidentally, our functional unit has roughly 23.5 grams of polyethylene terephthalate within it. So, ethylene oxide manufacture is something that we need to model ourselves. What do we do with the ethylene oxide? Well, we make ethylene glycol. So, ethylene glycol is a lot safer to handle than ethylene oxide, so we make ethylene oxide, then use it immediately, so we don't have it hanging around. What you don't have can't leak. And then we make, from ethylene glycol, our polyethylene terephthalate. However, this is incomplete, isn't it? Because we know that we need our diacid to react with our dialcohol. So, in addition to this picture, we also need to figure out how we make pure terephthalic acid. Now, as it happens, there are existing studies for the production of pure, ter pure terephthalic acid. Again, from paraxylene, from pyrolysis gasoline, from naphtha cracking. So it's all part of that benzene, toluene, xylene food chain. The final thing to think about is that our functional unit isn't 23.5 grams of polyethylene terephthalate. It's a 500 milliliter fizzy drinks bottle sitting on a supermarket shelf. So we've got the raw material for the bottle. Now we need to shape it, blow mold it, and transport it to its destination. So we're going to assume that there are existing studies that describe those processes. And so this is now what we call our polyethylene terephthalate value chain. We're looking at the production of the polymer all the way from its components, from ethylene and from pure terephthalic acid. And we're looking at making something from that polymer and delivering it to its destination. So, supporting all these processes, we need electricity. We need heat. We need process water. We need to treat wastewater. So, underlying the value chain that we've defined is a lot of background processes that, again, we need a lot of data for. So, life cycle analysis is a very data-intensive process. I want to introduce to you now the Sankey diagram. I mentioned that the Sankey diagram is a very visual way of being able to understand the energy flows through a process and, consequently, the energy required to make a functional unit. Let's do this by means of example. I'm displaying to you now crude oil being made into ethylene. We know that crude oil can produce naphtha, and from naphtha steam cracking we can make ethylene. So the material flow there is crude oil. But however, it's not a material flow. It's the energy wrapped up within that material. So we can figure out that we need 0.26 megajoules of energy to make ethylene. Now this energy is what we termed embedded energy. It is part 
of the crude oil. It's what the crude oil would give off if we burned it effectively. So this is the energy content flowing into a process from a raw material. Now, in making ethylene from naphtha, we know we have to put in heat. So we have naphtha cracking taking place in gas-fired furnaces. And so also included on the Sankey diagram are those processes that give us heat. In this case, we take natural gas and burn it. And by burning that natural gas, we produce enough heat to crack our naphtha. And so there we have on our Sankey diagram now the energy coming from a primary or a secondary energy source. What do we do with our ethylene? Well, we make something from ethylene. So we've got energy into our ethylene block. We also have material going out. So our ethylene itself will have an embedded energy. And this is the energy content of the material leaving that process, shown in orange. Now, as we look at this block containing ethylene, we've got energy in and energy out, but energy has to be conserved across a production process. So we have a bit of embedded energy within the material that we've made, so the balance of the energy must be that energy used to make the product. So that's where the energy balance is satisfied. And so here we have a visual representation of the energy required to make the ethylene for our functional unit. We've got crude oil bringing material in, and there's energy embedded within that material. We have natural gas being burnt to give heat, and we're looking at the number of megajoules required for that. Leaving our step, ethylene production step, we have the energy content within the ethylene, embedded energy again, and the energy used to make the product as well. So that's a simple example of a Sankey diagram. Let's see what a Sankey diagram looks like for polyethylene terephthalate production. So I'm now displaying the completed example that we just saw. We've got our crude oil and our natural gas making ethylene. We're now going to build on this. So the next step of this process is to make ethylene glycol, ethylene to ethylene glycol. We can look at the embedded energy in the ethylene glycol product. It's smaller than ethylene and the balance has to be processing energy. And so we can see how the processing energy accumulates through the value chain. Well, what's next? What's next is producing our diacid, pure terephthalic acid. Now, pure terephthalic acid production is very energy intensive. We can see that we've got our crude oil going in. Now, we know that the crude oil will be probably distilled in the naphtha, which will be cracked to pyrolysis gasoline, which in terms will produce paraxylene. That paraxylene will then be the feedstock to our pure terephthalic acid production process. It requires a lot of heat, which is why we're using a lot of natural gas. So pure terephthalic acid production requires a lot of energy this becomes important. Now, we also have contributions from coal and contributions from nuclear. This is the electricity required on the plant. And so if you look at the thickness of all the lines going into our pure terephthalic acid plant and compare them to our ethylene plant, we can very quickly see how much energy is wrapped up in producing pure terephthalic acid. So the orange bar leaving the pure terephthalic acid production block is again the energy embedded within the acid product and the grey bar leaving is a processing energy which is massive compared to the processing energy for ethylene. Okay, so the next step is to bring together our two raw materials, our ethylene glycol and our pure terephthalic acid and we've got our continuous polymerization process which is what we just looked at earlier. So this produces now our polyethylene terephthalate. Now there's a little bit of natural gas required for heat for this process. Again, it's a small amount of energy compared to that acid production step. Our product, however, is fairly energy rich. And so if you look at that conservation of energy across continuous polymerization, very little is actually required in processing energy. Most of the energy put in is wrapped up as embedded energy within the product. So another takeaway message here is polymers are very energy dense. What do we then do? We do a solid state polymerization. It's fairly negligible in terms of energy. We then have to make our bottle. We've got our polymer chips and we blow mold our bottle, which requires heat because we've got to melt the polymer again, form it, shape form it, and then demold it, cool it, and s assemble it somehow on a production line. And so we would expect, therefore, to be a lot of electricity involved within the molding step. Extrusion is electrically heated. 
After bottles have been moulded, what then happens? Well, we take our plastic bottle and we transport it. And we transport it to our destination. So, what we can see here very clearly is a diagram that maps the energy flows in producing our functional unit. Our functional unit being our fizzy drinks bottle sitting on a supermarket shelf. We've gone from cradle, crude oil, coal, natural gas, nuclear power, renewable electricity, to grave. That functional unit sitting in its required destination. And we can see also the amount of energy required to make that product. For our functional unit, we require 1.6 megajoules of processing energy. Embedded within our functional unit is 0.57 megajoules of energy. Now, let's have a look where each of the energy use centers are. So I'm going to put you a graph on the board now. On the y-axis is the primary energy use per functional unit. So it's megajoules per 500 mils of filled bottles sitting on a supermarket shelf. And I'm going to examine key stages of that value chain. Let's look at ethylene production. Well, it's around 0.4 megajoules per functional unit. Ethylene oxide and ethylene glycol production, less than about 0.1. Pure terephthalic acid, massive, about 1.3 megajoules per functional unit. What about the continuous polymerization? It's not very much, maybe about 0.15 megajoules. What about bottle moulding? Well, it's not insignificant, it's around the same as ethylene production. So, those data that I've displayed for you show very clearly where effort should be focused to minimise energy use in the process. And it's glaring at you there in red. It's a production of pure terephthalic acid. Now, what other environmental impacts does making this functional unit have? Well, we can list them out. Abiotic depletion potential, roughly about 2 megajoules. Acidification, 3 times 10 to the minus 4 kilos of sulphur dioxide equivalent. Eutrophication potential, 2 times 10 to the minus 5 kilos of phosphate equivalent, and so on and so forth. The interesting one to look at here is global warming potential. For our 30 odd grams of polyethylene terephthalate, we emit three times the mass of CO2. So it's about 92 grams of CO2 for every functional unit of bottle produced. So we can now clearly see where our energy use is and what our other environmental impact categories are. So, we've answered the question of energy production, we've quantified it. What happens if we use biomass? Can we displace some of this global warming potential? Can we get that 0.092 kilos of CO2 equivalent lower? What happening about recycling? If we want to try and incentivize people to remove plastics from the environment and recycle them, how does that affect key environmental impact metrics? And of course, one of the key ones that people worry about a lot and very, very uh, wisely is greenhouse gas emissions. So how does recycling affect that? So we're going to answer those two remaining questions in the final part of this lecture. But let's recap a few key points. So we've looked at how to construct a Sankey diagram and how to evaluate the environmental impacts for a given process. Hopefully this has given you an insight into the amount of data that you need to do this and the role of a chemical engineer in doing the process. So we need to know all the energy and environmental overheads of all the materials and all the energies at every stage of the process. Some of this information can be gleaned from existing peer-reviewed studies. However, sometimes it's work you need to do yourself. You need to be able to make accurate and validated process simulations. You need to do experimental work sometimes. It's very useful to visualise energy flows in Sankey diagrams because you can see in many ways which processing stage has the worst energy overhead. Similarly, if you break down all your environmental impact categories, you can see which processing stage again has the worst impact. Remember though, the definition of worst can be subjective because it may not be worse in every single impact category. So you have to decide, using your wisdom and experience, as to which environmental categories may rank, if you like, higher than others. Again, this highlights the importance of having to make difficult choices and highlights the importance of making those choices wisely.